Hi, this is Amy with the Hag Reads, and I'm going to discuss a duology today that I just finished reading. Um, so, yeah, the books are This Dark Intent by Kenneth Opal and Such Wicked Intent, also Kenneth Opal. Um, this is um, kind of a retelling. It's meant to serve as a prequel to uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So it is a YA fantasy novel um, that is a, um, it derives from Frankenstein, but it's kind of its own, It's so it's meant to be what happened to uh, Victor Frankenstein in his, um, his teenage years um, and, providing a backstory for uh, maybe an idea of how he became the way he was in um, the Frankenstein novel. Um, this is directed at YA readers um, and has the standard kind of characters you think. There's Victor and his twin brother Conrad. Um, it's been quite a while since I read um, the original Frankenstein, so it's probably around time to reread it again. Um, I don't remember uh, Victor Frankenstein having a twin brother. Um, I know he had other siblings, but I thought what he had was an older brother, which he does not have in this book. It's him and his twin brother. So I would have to go back and reread the original um, to know if, in fact, he had a twin brother. Um, but in the first book, um, This Dark Endeavor, uh, you have age 16 Victor um, his brother Conrad with a K uh, uh, their cousin Elizabeth their friend Henry their parents and then there are the two younger brothers and they don't really play in the story they just are, are kind of there and then um, the parents um, you see a little bit of the mother and um, a a small two medium amount of the father. The story really focuses on these teenagers and their lives. Um, and so they're living uh, on Lake Geneva. It's their, It's the summer. Um, and so they have pretty ideal, idealistic lives. They, you know, um, they're well-to-do. They spend their days at leisure. You know, boating on the lake. Uh, as the novel opens, they're putting on a play that their friend Henry wrote. Um, but then, shortly after the novel starts, the brother Conrad uh, becomes ill with a fever, and he's weak, and there's never really any cause given. But as the first novel progresses, he gets worse and worse, and um, Victor watches all of these uh, physicians come and try and treat his brother and they're using leeches and they really don't know what they're doing and so he becomes kind of contemptuous of them and um, desperate in his own way to save his brother and um, at the beginning of the no near the beginning of the novel they discover um, within the family library a secret passage that leads to an occult library um, and so knowing that this is there, he becomes infatuated with the idea that he can cure his brother through alchemy. Um, he's looking for the elixir of life, and he's got a book by Thomas Agrippa. Um, and then one of the, he, one of the maids uh, provides a lead to an, uh, an alchemist in Geneva. And the three of them, Elizabeth, Victor, and Henry, um, engage with this person in pursuit of the elixir of life because he thinks it's the only way to save his brother and they're doing this behind their parents back um, because the father uh, discovered them in this occult library and basically told them don't ever come down here this is dangerous it's you know all the things you would tell a teenager not to do and of course what are they gonna do exactly what you told them not to so this first book is uh, the progression of them trying to find the elixir of life, their personal interactions, this desperation about his brother. Um, and then the second book, 
uh, continues with that. Uh, and I can't tell you anything at all about the second book because it would be giving away the ending of the first book. But it's a continuation of the same themes. It moves away from uh, the pursuit of the elixir of life um, into some other occult ideas and practices um, and an increasingly desperate sense that there's something they need to do and they can't quite get there. But also that um, maybe things aren't quite what they seem. Um, in the second, in the first book, um, it's all pretty uh, interesting, and I feel like there were minimal, there was a minimal amount of tropiness. Um, but you get into the second book, and I found the subject matter more interesting, but the characters infinitely less interesting. There develops in here this love quadrangle. Everybody is in love with the Elizabeth character, and as they pursue further and further and dabbling in the occult, they all kind of become paranoid and deceitful, and so um, there's a lot of conflict, um, jealousy, and uh, inappropriate behavior by the two of the three guys that Elizabeth is really not interested in and everybody thinks they have a chance and um, so they're just kind of being selfish jerky teenagers but they're also struggling with larger adult issues that you know they're not fully prepared in their pampered lives to deal with um, but in both these books they're largely left to their own devices they're running around the countryside and they're um, doing things in the manner and nobody really seems to know what they're doing or to care what they're doing. Um, overall, as a set, as a full story between the first book and the second book, um, I really did enjoy it. Um, I found a lot of the reading in the second book to be frustrating because you could see what their the characters' motivations were, but they were all going after something in a single-minded pursuit of an end goal but because they had all become kind of paranoid and suspicious and um, their occult activities had kind of heightened um, some of their personality traits that were uh, kind of less than endearing to begin with but amplified them and so what you wind up with is, is this paranoid uh, angry uh, suspicious and so you get these very very um, angry paranoid interactions um, and so that wasn't quite as much fun to read I, I understand it for the uh, purposes of the plot and overall outside of this um, I found it to be entertaining enough and that um, I would definitely recommend it to YA readers or people who enjoy YA literature and who enjoy retellings. Um, it's a cute little story. It, it touches on, you know, family dynamics, interpersonal relationships, um, the importance of temperance in your own personality, you know, not allowing your negative character traits to kind of overwhelm your whole personality like you you get to see as this as the second book goes along how that kind of ner negative character traits that they possessed in the first books but were kind of held in check by these friendships because you know they were willing at that time to listen to the other people and to kind of temper their responses to different things but in the second book all of that goes haywire and so you just have them um pursuing things you know in ways that aren't that healthy personally but also probably as an end game or not healthy as a group either um at the end of the second book you know they throw some serious shade at what's going to happen in the future with victor frankenstein and i found that to be you know charming as well so um despite what i didn't like about the second book Overall, it's a strong duology. Um, 
I don't know that Frankenstein purists are going to be like, oh yeah, this is totally what happened to him before he, you know, built the Frankenstein monster. But, uh, it's an interesting theory. Uh, it's an interesting uh, alternative storyline for his youth. Um, it makes me want to go back and read the original and um, in terms of if I would purchase this book, um, it wouldn't be at the top of my list, but if I found it someplace inexpensively, I would pick them both up because um, I would probably reread this in a couple of years. Um, I wouldn't reread it very often, but I would recommend it to others. If you like retellings, if you like prequels to, you know, what is considered classic literature or something that you know well, like the Frankenstein story is relatively well known through books and movies. Um, this is kind of a fun play on that and it's something that's, I don't think the original Frankenstein novel is inaccessible to teens, um, but this is written specifically with that audience in mind and so it comes with, um, for adult readers, the uh, dangers or the uh, things maybe that we don't like about YA literature because I don't necessarily think that really even needs to be a category. I think that um, we're dumbing down books and spoon feeding literature that is highlighting um, quite often all of the negative things about being a teenager and showing over and over again that things teenagers do that are stupid and harmful are acceptable ways to behave. Twilight says it's okay to sneak a boy in your room if he really loves you. Um, a lot of YA trilogies in the uh, kind of paranormal romance area say it's okay for you to be in love with a bad boy that's emotionally abusive to you. Um, all of them kind of say that it's okay to be a uh, sexually active in a, in a form of serial monogamy as long as you really care about the boy. Um, and not that I'm a prude or that I think there's anything wrong with um, sexuality, even for teens, but given that there's still so much slut shaming and um, still a lot of stigma for females to be, um, to be confident about their sexuality and to be sexually active um, kind of opens them up to um, it, some negative consequences in terms of how people perceive them, not um, that they're actually sluts or that there's anything shameful in enjoying sex and pursuing it with somebody that you care about in a safe way. Um, but I have found, by and large, that when it comes to teenage boys, if a girl has had sex, they aren't emotionally able to differentiate that she had sex with somebody that she cared about. Um, I think that it's perceived that once she's had sex, she's open for business. If you had sex with Joe, why won't you have sex with me? And then Ben thinks, well, if you had sex with him, you know, and him, then certainly why would you reject me? And it, it creates this expectation that once a girl is sexually active that she will engage sexually with any boy. Um, and I'm not saying that's every guy, but it is a relatively common perception in real life, not, not necessarily just a fictional, um, you know, idea. So um, there's some danger in that being perceived as the norm that um, after a certain age, you should be sexually active because all of the characters you read about in books generally are. Um, it's more the exception than the rule for um, teenage female characters to be sexually active. And a number of storylines are involved in, girl, in, in how the girls lose their virginity to the guy they care about. Um, and I'm thinking here of White Rabbit Chronicles where the relatively um, sheltered main character falls in love with this bad boy who is in fact um, emotionally abusive, distant, not supportive, 
although, you know, they're, they're purporting in the book that he is, but if you really look at his behavior and how he treats her and the girl and the other girl in the story, um, he's not a healthy male character as a love interest. Um, he does tell her that he doesn't want to engage with her in a sexual, in sexually yet because he doesn't feel like she's ready and, um, I don't know if he coaches it in terms of they are not ready for it in their relationship. Um, but she wants to have sex and he puts it off for a while and they do wind up having sex, but you're talking about something that you're hiding from the parents that he's um, sneaking into her room. She's sneaking into his room. So, um, I think that a lot of times these, it's normalizing behavior that probably shouldn't be encouraged in hormonally volatile, you know, adolescent, um, people. It used to be that once you kind of passed middle grade, then you read adult books of varying sophistication and, um, there was no YA. And I really think that YA literature is often an amazing thing, but I also think it's normalizing behaviors, um, that possibly, uh, could, I really think that there's a, a chance that we'll look back in 50 years and wonder what were we thinking? These are such, you know, that we, not only did we dumb down literature, but then we made behaviors that we, that parents try and discourage in their children, the norm. Um, you may disagree with me and that's perfectly fine. This is just how I think about it and how I really think about when I read YA literature, um, when I see sexually active teens, how it's treated and how others treat these teenage girls. And I think in the real world, there's far less sexually active teens than are portrayed in movies and books, but that these same teens may get the idea that, well, gosh, if everybody else is doing it, if that's how it's portrayed, then I should be doing it too. Um, instead of having more of an even balance of, you know, characters that are sexually active and characters that are adamant um, that maybe they don't want to when they're teens or they're waiting to get married or um, they're, they would rather focus on See, I'd rather it was not, I'm waiting till I get married, because I don't think that's realistic either, that what if you don't get married until you're 30, so you should never have sex? I don't think that's healthy either. But where are the books, or where are more of the books that focus on um, teens who are trying to do well in school, who are preparing for their future life, and not just going to college? Where are the books about teens who are prepping for uh hands-on uh, apprenticeship type, type jobs, you know, um, plumbers and electricians and all of those sorts of things. Um, because now there's a bigger drive um, to send kids to kind of technical schools um, towards the end of their high school careers, like after their sophomores, where they start getting some practical training that's going to be for a career um, that's not college bound. Um, where are books that are portraying characters that are doing that? Um, so that's kind of, <laughs> I've gotten off the, if you like retellings or prequels to horror novels, yes, I recommend these. They're awesome. Um, Kenneth Opal is the author of the, um, the Silver Wing series, which, um, uh, my, my biological son loved when he was about 14. He voraciously read them. Um, Kenneth Opal writes, um, well, um, I think these stories are well thought out. Uh, it doesn't leave a lot of loose ends. Um, they were thought provoking and all of that. And then I got off on a tangent <laughs> about, um, adolescence and fiction. Um, if you have any thoughts about it and you want to share them with me, I'd be perfectly happy to hear them. Um, these are just my thoughts on, on how I feel about, um, YA fiction, which I do like. And how I feel like it might be influencing young readers, particularly uh, girls or young women. Um, and having raised, you know, three girls and having had a fair number of young women in my life that I interact with, I'm concerned about this, this current trend. And I'd be interested to know, 
what anyone else's thoughts are on this, certainly. Um, that is all I have for today. Um, I'm not saying anyone shouldn't love YA if they do, that it's wrong to read it. Um, I'm just saying I think there's a, a chance for some dialogue here um, to maybe demystify some things about sex and sexuality that are going on in YA novels that most teens don't want to talk about with their parents um, or a responsible adult like a teacher, but that probably there are conversations that need to be going on. So I will see you guys next time. I hope that you are having a wonderful um, weekend and, um, uh, or no, not weekend. It's, it's Tuesday or Wednesday, isn't it? I don't even know when it is anymore. Well, I hope you're having a wonderful week. Um, happy whatever time of day it is for you. Bye.